Hello, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, we're really lucky to be hosting two students from Ohio State University this today and yesterday. Um, and um, we're going to be splitting the time. So first up, we have Chelsea Rodriguez. She is a second year master's student at Ohio State. And um, after she gives her talk, we'll leave about five minutes for questions and then we'll move on to John's talk. So Chelsea, take it away. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you all hear me all? Okay. So my name is Chelsea Rodriguez. As she said, I'm a second year master's student at the Horticulture and Crop Sciences Department of the Ohio State University. And today I will be the, um, presenting part of my thesis and some results of native warm season grasses implementation protocols and relationships with our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. So what are cool season grasses? Cool season grasses are commonly used grasses and they have been used due to the many years provided of raising hay and silage. They have longer growing seasons in temperate climates and now that we have global warming and high temperatures, we have they're affected by the summer slump, which is a temperature rise above 70 degrees Fahrenheit and drought environment. And this mostly affects tall fescue, which goes through toxicosis, which is uh, just a, um, an endophyte fungi that affects the ruminants very badly. Now, um, Cool season grasses have this decreasing yield during the summer season, mostly through June to September, but warm season grasses can supply for cool season grasses during this lump of the cool season grasses. So what are native warm season grasses then? So native warm season grasses are once furry grasses. They once roamed the great plains of the United States, but they're tall grasses and they have the benefit of being drought resistant and to the temperature rising up to 80 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So they are more um, tolerant to the global warming than the cool season grasses. And they have also a benefit of increasing wildlife for flora and fauna with the northern bug bug quail serving as an example here. But they have some unanswered questions that I'm going to be addressing during this presentation in this seminar. And that must be addressed in order for them to be productive and to be highly used for farmers and to be adapted to their farms. So firstly, how can we germinate native worm season grasses? Secondly, how do native worm season grasses interact with our muscular mycorrhizal fungi? And how do we implement native worm season grasses faster? This is very important. And lastly, how do native worm season grasses grow? So firstly, we're going to address how can we germinate native warm season grasses. We did this in my lab by doing seed chamber trials with big blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, and eastern gallon grass. Now, big blue stem, Indian grass, and switchgrass germinated under these specifications, which is light simulated, day simulated for 30 degrees Celsius for eight hours, and night simulated 20 degrees Celsius for 16 hours. But Eastern Gamma grass was a whole other scenario. It did not germinate under these specifications. So then we needed to do a bit more for it to germinate properly. Now, the reason for Eastern Gamma grass to not germinate properly is because it has the highest dormancy levels up to a 90%. It has poor seedling viability, so it will die easily when being um, seeded. And it has to go through a process called vernalization, which is the cooling of the seed before um, the warm uh, spring or summer when it germinates. Now, native warm season grasses have poor seedling vigor. We have to germinate these grasses because after this, we're going to inoculate them with our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. So then I had to replant them got several times in this plant bag. So I, for one, know for a fact that it was very poor in terms of like just establishing from this first week. Now for Eastern Gamagas trial for breaking dormancy and low germination rates, we tried two seed brands, which was Fowler Seeds and Ernseed. 
we tried different additives such as captain, which is a fungicide. As you can see in the photo before, there was a lot of fungi in the eastern demograph, as well water. And we did different physical alterations for the seeds, such as seed head removal, pre-shield prior to putting them in the seed chamber for eight weeks or for 10 weeks, and as well doing this pre-shield with seed head removal and non-physical alteration at all. And then we tried different temperatures for the eastern gamma grass to see if this would break the dormancy, as you can see, like I mentioned before, that it has to go through a process called vernalization, which is the cooling of the seed. So we tried negative 17 degrees Celsius to 4.44 degrees Celsius to a 30 degrees Celsius to see the extremes of this. And then it took as little as 19 days to germinate, which was a lot, but also it took as long as 49 days to germinate. And now for the results, they were pretty low still. This was not viable for like farmers for, for, for them to do this. So as you can see, all the ones that had seed head, head removal were did not yield any results. And our highest treatment was with earned seed, with water, no physical alteration, temperature 30 degrees Celsius for 36 days to germinate, 16.7% which is this treatment here. And this is very low for farmers to consider this viable. So then this leads us to our next question, which is um, how native worm system grasses could interact with our vascular mycorrhizal fungi and how can this organism benefit them? So for this, I did a greenhouse experiment with the species that did germinate big blue stem Indian grass and sweet grass with applications of fertilizer as low as five grams and as ten as and as high as ten grams. And why is a vascular mycorrhizal fungi a tool for native worm season grasses? It has a nature to extend the roots of the grasses, and this is a problem for native worm season grasses. Native worm season grasses have little to no lateral roots, and blue season grasses establish faster on the field while germinating. This lateral roots, which you can see in the um, left picture, gives the stability to the plant to be able to germinate faster and just to like stand up while germinating. So AMS has a nature to extend roots into finer ones. So other benefits of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi are the uptake of phosphorus in deficient to low levels of this nutrient. Faster photosynthetic assimilation for the plants that it colonizes, breakdown of nitrogen organic molecules, occupying spaces in the roots where pathogens could enter from, the extension of roots by creating smaller root diameters, and for a small price of the molecule glucose, this soil microorganism, which is our vascular mycorrhizal fungi, forms this mutualism with the grasses. So again, we did a greenhouse experiment from May to August of 2022 with four inoculants and two levels of fertilizer. And these were our four treatments. We had the no inoculum, which was our control, the microfly, which was our commercial type of inoculum for the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, and two um, treatments that were with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that were extracted from 1% soil from our well-established native warm season grass field and 10% soil from our Native worm season grass field. Now, um, just like a bit of an explanation here, I'm going to be explaining this grass field, but this grass here, sorry. Um, when I refer to the dry matter, I'll be referring to the yield. And I, when I refer to the percentage of mycorrhizal colonization, I'll be referring to the one that was measured at the time of the root, looking at the roots of the native worm season grasses. Um, other things also as a legend, you see all these letters in the lower parts of the graph. So the L's means low fertilizer rates and the H means high fertilizer rates. The N means media with no inoculum as before. S1 will mean media with 1% soil. S10 will mean media with 10% soil. And M will be media with 0.255 grams cubic meters of microfly. So as here first, you can see this set of graphs that is just the dry matter. And as you can see, Indian graph, the last one here, 
had almost not yielded not results except for this soil with 10% media and low fertilizer. And then for the rest of them, mostly they did yield the results for big blue stem and switchgrass. Now, when we look at the mycorrhizal colonization, we can see that the most colonization in all of the treatments were mostly with a 10% media, media with 10% soil. And it was mostly true for like the low amounts of fertilizer in all of them. When we put these two components together, we can see that the components of yield increase with AMF colonization. Because if we see the treatments that had lower colonization or no colonization at all, well, they have less dry matter or less yield in comparison to the ones that have more media with 10% soil. So as well for the average stand height, which is a proxy for farmers in the, in the field to see how much the yield is going. Um, as well, we have the media with 10% soil being the one in the leading, and then with media with 1% soil, and then mycoplay and no Mycoplasma at all. And this was the average of all the native worm bees and grasses being big blue stem, Indian grass, and switch grass. And this was the height. So, as well for the colonization rate, the one with the highest colonization rate was Indian grass, followed by switch grass with 60.7 and big blue stem 33.7. So, now how do we can implement native worm bees and grasses on the field? Um, we wanted to do this because um, native worm season grasses, as you can see, have very hard time being established on the field and just growing. So we wanted to apply color cross to see how native worm season grasses grew afterward. So now we're on the native worm season grass phase, and this part that I'm going to show you today is the color cross. So we had three treatments in the field, conventional and organic. Uh, the second one was conventional inorganic with one cover crop and organic with two cover crops. So cover crops are an answer to transition into native worm season grasses because they increase fertility and nutrient cycling, and mostly because we wanted to see them suppressing weeds and previous perennial grasses. And two of the cover crops that we used increase the soil organic matter, microbial activity, and can supply nitrogen to the stands as well. So more into detail into the treatments. The first treatment was inorganic conventional with treatment with herbicide application and no cover crop. The second one and the third one are the ones that I'm going to be presenting results of today, which is the inorganic with one cover crop that was with treatment with herbicide application and zero rye during the winter season. And the number three is organic with two cover crops, no herbicide application at all and cover crop of sorghum sudan grass and cowpea during the summer and oats during the winter. And this was done as a randomized complete block design, a three by three, um, with three treatments, three species, and four replications in eastern Ohio, southeastern Ohio, and southwestern Ohio. So firstly, for the sorghum sudan grass and cowpea, as you can see, this is the average per sort of category of the yield provided in the plots. So the sorghum sudan grass and the cowpea provided more yield than the oats and the rye. And as you can see, there was still some weeds in them as well for the oats and for the rye as well. Now, for the forage quality, we wanted to see if this would also provide a good feed for cattle, for example. So we know that a good hay crop is 48 to 55 of neutral detergent fiber, and fruit protein is 15 to 25 of the rate. So for Eastern, for crude protein, it was pretty good, and Southeastern, it was a good average among all of them. But Southwestern, how would you? had a more of a location effect with lower rates of crude protein. For neutral detergent fiber, it was also very good for eastern and southeastern, but with southwestern Ohio again, it was more of a more um, above the line of the neutral detergent fiber rate. So for this, we saw that there was a location effect because this southwestern Ohio location was drier and also um, it was differently managed. 
So the last part of this presentation is to see how native worm season grasses grow. Um, and for this, I will, I will be measuring leaf area index, leaf length, and classifying leaf state in growing mature denizen or death while measuring the skin stem length at every stage of the leaf. So the projection for this uh, project is morphogenesis. Basically, um, uh, we are doing this because we want to determine um, just management recommendations for the farmers and we want them to know how to cut their grasses. So morphogenesis is just simple yet repetitive measures to determine the graphic rate of growing and how they die. And I will be putting seeds of native worm season grasses during May. And the phase two will be to measure the leaf elongation, the leaf appearance, and the leaf life duration of these plants and the stem elongation. Um, for the phase three, I will measure rate of all of this, of the leaf life duration, leaf appearance, and the stem elongation while measuring our muscular mycorrhizal condensation rate and seeing how they affected the native worm season grasses. So some main answers from these presentations are, how can we germinate native worm season grasses? Uh, 30 degrees Celsius for eight hours or 20 degrees Celsius for 16 hours for all of them except if they're down with grass. How do we implement native worm season grasses faster? Cover crops make way and supply great quality feed but it determines on location. So how do native worm season grasses interact with our muscular mycorrhizal fungi? They can increase yield with high colonization rates and it depends on the inoculum applied. And how do native worm season grasses grow? It's an experiment to start to make. I, before, I didn't know how do native worm season grass grow and I thought um, each leaf was just a leaf, but really like for each grass, like each leaf has the capacity with the very stem to transform into another plant. So that's why it's important to measure like this morphogenesis part. And with that, um, that's all my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll be taking any questions you have now. Yes. So Chelsea, given that you found AMF, uh, it's important for yield um, on your native form season grasses. Did you measure AMF colonization of any of your cover crop, um, cover crop roots that you grew, the sorghum, Sudan grass, or um, do you think any of those have the capacity to uh, stimulate AMF in the soil? So that's a great question. You were asking me if I mentored a vascular mycorrhizal colonization in my cover crop. Mm -hmm. So I did not. I actually wanted to, at first, when I started my experiment, I wanted to take the arbuscular mycorrhizal condensation inoculum from those pots. <laughs> like, but since it was not established, my advisor was like, no, maybe this is not a viable option yet. Maybe there's not enough arbuscular mycorrhizal condensation or um, fungi there yet. So um, I to answer your question, I did not measure it, but I do um, recognize that it would be very interesting to measure and to see since it says that in literature that it increases soil organic matter and microbial activity. I bet that maybe we can find differences there. Thank you for your question. <laughs> yes. Um, so the low fertility treatment best for growing native worm season grasses like do they generally prefer like low fertility sites like what are the site characteristics that are most favorable to their establishment for native worm season grasses um you're asking if like I, i'm sorry i'm repeating the question just i just want to understand like if low fertilizer rates are preferred by native worm season grasses yeah and like do sites that are um you know not necessarily that have low fertility, are they better sites for the, uh, the establishment of them, of these other grasses? Um, so to answer your question, um, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that colonize these plants need to have a sort of deficiency of phosphorus. So I would say that, yes, they need like a deficiency to form this relationship with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi with the native warm season grasses. So I would say that, yeah. Thank you for your question.
Yes, in your evaluation, you said that you're going to evaluate the number of uh, leads and the teams. Are you, are you going to evaluate the number of fillers too? And the number of fillers? Yeah. Um, actually, yes. Because uh, I have to um, I have to actually select the fillers that I'm going to evaluate and then start evaluating like each leaf of each pillar. <laughs> So it's going to be a lot of measurements, but it's going to be a lot of like, recommendations to be done with those measurements. Oh, yes. Do you think soil type influenced your results for the three sites across the state of Ohio, especially given the difference in glaciation? Um, yes. I do think there was like a, for, especially for forest quality, I think it did affect it a lot of the, like the rates of all the fruit protein and the neutral nutrient fiber, because the baseline was pretty different too when we started. So. And thank you so much. <laughs> So our next speaker, he is actually doctor. He just had his defense last week. Um, Dr. John Ertel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. John Ertel, he will talk about his uh, PhD researches on in the indoor vert vertical farm. And Okay. All right, let's come through. Okay. All right. Great. Well, thank you guys uh, for having us out. It's uh, really exciting to be able to uh, interact with other graduate students from other universities. I feel like we. Uh, and don't get that chance while I break all of your very nice things here. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, like I said, I'm John Riddle uh, from Ohio State University. I'm in Dr. Sherry Kubota's lab. Um, I just realized I still have a candidate on the slideshow, but that's okay. Um, but uh, I'm happy to talk to you today about some of my PhD research uh, looking at indoor vertical farms and uh, managing some of the nutrient deficiencies we, we run into in these types of environments. So uh, controlled environment agriculture is a method of growing food crops under some type of protection. We're trying to modify the environment to enhance the growing conditions. We might do this for various reasons. Uh, originally, a lot of the uh, CEA was developed as a way to look at crops under research scenarios so that we could take out a lot of the potential uh, uh, factors that might occur in the field that we, that we couldn't quite control. Um, today, the range of CEA can be anything from lower tag type uh, hoop houses where we have uh, skeletal structure and uh, some kind of plastic covering, flooding and sunlight, but uh, preventing a lot of the uh, uh, abiotic uh, stress that could happen through the environment. Uh, and this is more like a season extension practice. Uh, and then we can go all the way up to fully enclosed greenhouses under glass, uh, which uh, many of you are familiar with, and then all the way up to uh, indoor farms where we're totally enclosed. Uh, inside some type of building structure, uh, usually using sole source electrical lighting instead of sun. Uh, so over the past 10 to 15 years, indoor farms have been growing really rapidly in the US. Uh, it's been a major area of development um, worldwide. They've also uh, seen quite a lot of implementation for uh, various reasons. Um, we can localize production with these types of systems to produce fresh high quality food without the use of many chemical inputs that we typically have to rely upon uh, in other production systems. Uh, it also allows us to reduce the number of food miles since these uh, types of farms can be located pretty much anywhere. And so we can locate them close to urban centers, food deserts, anywhere where there's a consumer population that we want to target. Uh, and that allows us to also supply local jobs to those regions. Um, and due to the uh, vertically stacking of many types of these systems, uh, we're able to increase land use efficiency, sometimes up to longer times over uh, the production ca uh, capacity that the same square area might have in the open field environment. Uh, and typically, these types of systems and indoor farms are producing leafy greens and uh, microgreens uh, using hydroponics, which we're cultivating without the use of soils uh, or substrates. 
and that can allow uh, us to have an increased water use efficiency to be 90% less water uh, consumption than uh, some open field production. Uh, so while this type of environment allows us to heavily control things and allows us to have a really robust production of a lot of different uh, crops in this environment, most of these growers are producing leafy greens like lettuce. Uh, under these conditions, we have a unique challenge of lettuce tipper, which is uh, uh, a calcium deficiency happening in the localized region around the young inner leaves near the meristem, which is at the center of this compact head. So while we have very healthy looking lettuce coming out of the farm, uh, we peel back those layers of leaves and we start to see this necrotic tissue form, reducing the marketability of this product uh, and really straining a lot of the revenue streams for these uh, growers. So uh, at a deeper level, uh, tip burn is really a uh, uh, degradation of the cell wall that's occurring uh, in the tissues of these plants, um, mostly due to a lack of the formation of pectin, which is a critical linkage component of the cell wall. Um, when we have a calcium deficiency occur, uh, this linkage component uh, becomes uh, these Polysaccharide chains are not able to form because the linkage component is broken, right? And so we don't have that available, that calcium cation to uh, link these structures together. And so we have, uh, it's much easier for that cell wall to lose its integrity, uh, break, and then cause damage to surrounding tissues, leading to uh, this necrosis that occurs uh, in, these, in these young leaves. Uh, so to understand how that, that might play out, we said to understand the calcium relationship in the plant which is really just as simple as a supply and demand relationship. So during the nighttime, calcium is driven through the plant uh, by mass flow, primarily by root pressure, as water and calcium are taken up to the roots and driven into the xylem at night. During the daytime, this uh, uh, calcium supply is mediated by transportation. So um, as you can see in these different uh, colored, or I'm sorry, in these different sides arrows, uh, we often see higher transpiration rates of these outer leaves, and that's driving more calcium there, uh, while these inner leaves are often enclosed in this structure, and we have less transpiration happening uh, at this uh, level uh, closest to the meristem. And so that's where we're seeing that calcium deficiency occur. Um, and so the, the calcium demand on the other side of this relationship is uh, mostly driven by the growth rate. And so in an indoor farm setting, the growth of lettuce looks like an exponential curve. So if we see the relative growth rate on the x-axis here and fresh on the y-axis, somewhere about 20 to 28 days after transplanting lettuce into uh, these hydroponic systems, we typically start to see that deficiency appear uh, up on the, uh, as we keep with continue growing that lettuce. A typical production cycle in this system is about 28 days. And so uh, growers really want to capitalize on this exponential growth rate that's occurring towards the end of the production cycle. So we're getting most of our yield uh, towards the end of that, uh, that period. This also is simply a function of calcium demand as that, uh, that growth rate increases. We're seeing that increased demand of calcium, but we're also seeing a reduction in the amount of mass flow that's being driven to the inner leaves compared to uh, the rest of the plant. So in three different lettuce growing environments, ranging from the open field greenhouse to the indoor farm, uh, we have different uh, amounts of uh, environmental impact that's going to drive transpiration for these plants. So things like wind, uh, uh, temperature, high temperatures, uh, radiation from the sun um, versus uh, uh, most radiation being from electrical lighting, due to the differences in some of the radiation that's intercepted by these plants, we're going to drive less transpiration in some of these indoor environments due to the change in light quality. And then also, as we control the environment, we're going to reduce the amount of uh, temperature changes. We're gonna reduce the amount of airspeed over these plants. And so that's gonna limit our transpiration rate. So our relative transpiration is gonna decrease from left to right. As that transpiration rate decreases, we also see an increase in the relative tip burn risk. Uh, and so we want to uh, be able to better uh, quantify some of this relationship. So there are a few strategies currently used to prevent tipper. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Uh, a lot of growers have moved to a system where they try and harvest this, this crop early before the tipper even occurs. Of course, that means you have to plant at a higher density uh, and do two two-week plantings in place of one four-week planting. Um, you can reduce the growth rate and slow the growth of these plants, and that's going to limit the calcium demand. You can also apply a foliar spray, uh, which is going to increase that calcium supply. You can 
recruit exogenous calcium at the leaf surface. Um, but in the indoor farm setting, there's uh, uh, some drawbacks to this. So as we increase this planting density, we're going to have to invest more labor to do more harvest, more seeding, more transplanting. It's going to increase all of your operating expenses for seed costs, material costs. Uh, and so generally, it quickly becomes uh, less revenue uh, uh, effective to uh, implement this type of um, production. Um, when we reduce the growth rate, we're going to reduce that revenue for that single crop as we're producing less biomass. That might result in less harvest per year or smaller harvests over the course of the year, again, reducing your revenue stream either way. Um, and then also, if we apply foliar calcium sprays, there's in the indoor farm setting potential for that. Uh, that spray to damage equipment, um, getting the plants wet could increase disease. Uh, it also limits the gas exchange of those plants as that water has to move away from the leaf surface before we can actually begin gas exchange again and maximize photosynthesis. Uh, and also growers invest a lot of money in the lights and equipment and structures that they have in these, in these systems. So we, they really want to limit the amount of uh, potentially damaging uh, applications that they can do uh, in this system. So we wanted to develop a few things, and I have a list of hypotheses here that I'll return to at the end as well. Um, but most of the seed companies that are uh, producing seed for these lettuce growers are selecting seed that seems to perform well. And they're testing seed uh, uh, different genetics of, of seed cultivars under greenhouse systems, which are naturally going to have more transpiration and less tipper and uh, uh, likelihood than indoor farm settings. So we wanted to standardize a little bit more of this, uh, the way in which we test lettuce for uh, tipper. Um, and so we, we think that we can develop this tipper inducing condition to evaluate that risk of tipper in that indoor farm setting. Um, due to the shape of various lettuce morphologies, we think that ones that enclose the meristem are going to have a much higher risk of tipper than ones that have a more open structure where the meristem might be exposed or at least more exposed uh, than, uh, than other varieties. And that also that the seed company recommendations for lettuce um, may not be effective at predicting the risk because they've been tested in a greenhouse condition versus an indoor farm condition. Uh, and then we wanted to explore some mitigation methods for uh, averting and mitigating tipper risk. So, um, like I mentioned, slowing the growth can reduce our revenue, but we wanted to try doing some kind of end of production lighting treatments to prevent tipper or at least reduce tipper. Um, uh, and here we'll uh, I'll, I'll talk about this very shortly, but uh, we think that reducing this light intensity of the crop towards the end of the growing cycle could reduce the tipper in severity. It may also reduce yield considerably, um, but we'll uh, uh, basically, if that reduction in yield is less than the reduction in tipper, this might be a profitable strategy, uh, but it also might be more most beneficial for high tipper risk cultivars. And then we also wanted to explore a rather unique mechanism of this dim nighttime lighting, um, which we thought we would be able to increase the transpiration of lettuce during the nighttime when there's no demand for growth. So there's no calcium demand. We could stimulate uh, the plants to uh, have some transpirational flow so we can drive mass flow of calcium uh, and hopefully prevent that deficiency. Um, there's also a, a hypothesis about the, the component of red light in the spectrum. Uh, that I'll talk about a little bit more later, and that um, we should be able to produce different with this type of strategy. So all the experiments were, were set up about the same way, very much similar to how indoor farms typically are growing lettuce. We have a two-week seedling uh, growth period, um, and then we transplant uh, when the plants are about this about this big, so usually two to three true leaf stage for our crop production that lasts four weeks, and results in these uh, uh, very large, you know, hundreds of grand plus heads at the end of that four week cycle. Uh, we're doing seedling growth in growth chambers, and then uh, the production is happening within uh, two identical walk-in uh, growth chambers in NFT, nutrient film technique, hydroponic systems. Uh, and we're growing these uh, on four identical carts. And so we're able to uh, design our experiments based on this uh, basically uh, uh, multi-chamber uh, design. So the first thing we want to do is develop a condition that is going to induce tipper. We want to be able to evaluate how severely these different commercial cultivars are going to get tipper under uh, conditions, somewhat mimicking indoor farms, but changing a couple things 
to make it more likely that this difference is going to occur. So we had a uh, rather typical 16 hour uh, photo period, eight hour nighttime, uh, 23 and 19 degrees D day and nighttime temperatures, uh, uh, relative humidity of about 75% during the daytime, which is a little bit higher than typically is used. Um, we also injected CO2 into the chamber. So uh, 1000 ppm or 1000 micromoles per mole is um, about two and a half times the atmospheric concentration of CO2. Uh, many of these indoor growers do that to uh, maximize the growth rate of these plants, uh, make it easier for them to take up carbon dioxide and use photosynthesis. Um, for the light intensity, uh, basically relatively high light intensity, so 290 micromoles per meter square per second, which is uh, uh, just shy of 17 moles per day uh, of light, uh, which is uh, um, rather high towards the production and in the production side uh, of leafy greens. Uh, we also had a very slow airflow rate. So this is 0 0.07 meters per second in the downward and horizontal direction, which is uh, very, very slow uh, in these types of environments. Um, and the goal here was to reduce transpiration further than is already reduced in these indoor farm conditions so that we can try and force different to happen. Uh, we also used a rather purple-ish spectrum with this two to one to seven blue to green to red uh, spectrum, which is uh, common in indoor farms because of the efficiency of blue and uh, red LEDs. So we selected 10 uh, commercial cultivars that were reported as sensitive by other growers or stakeholders. Uh, and then we were able to acquire these seeds that are uh, fall into different morphological categories. So butterhead, romaine, and leafy type lettuces, um, ranging in color as well. Uh, green, non anthocyanin producing or low anthocyanin producing cultivars or red high anthocyanin producing cultivars. Uh, and these differing cultivars were also recommended for production systems by the seed company, either indoor, meaning indoor greenhouses, uh, indoor farms and greenhouses, outdoor open field cultivation, or both types uh, indoor and outdoor cultivation systems. Uh, and so we grew these plants into that zipper inducing condition for those, uh, those four weeks post transplant. Uh, and we saw similar tip burn emergence among these different plants. So uh, on the X axis is, our, is the cultivar name and the Y axis is the number of days it took uh, before tip burn occurred on each of these plants. Uh, and the average is about 22 plus or minus 2.6 days uh, until tip burn symptoms appear, uh, but rather consistent across that group. Uh, we can also see one cultivar performed rather well and had later, later tip burn emergence. Um, but the tip burn severity was, uh, a bit more variable. So 40 plus or minus 18% of these leaves had tip burn, which you can see uh, in the dark spots that are forming on the margins of these leaves over here. Uh, and so we have quite a range of this different tip burn severity. And so some cultivars had uh, very, very low tip burn uh, severity. Other ones had uh, more than half the leaves uh, had tip burn uh, towards the upper end. And so we have uh, quite a discrepancy between um, uh, in this germplasm. Uh, and then we look at the relationship with morphology, which we thought we would see uh, a big difference between cultivars like romaine that form this dense, uh, this dense heading structure and block out all those inner leaves from transpiring. Uh, we actually didn't see any differences between these three different morphological categories. And we didn't see any differences in different severity between red or green type lettuces either, uh, which was um, not uh, the opposite of what we expected for uh, the morphological types. But um, the recommendation of different production systems by these seed companies uh, was actually rather effective. So those recommended for indoor growing cultivation systems to have a lower tip burn severity in our tip burn inducing condition than those that were recommended for outdoor both types of production systems, which at least shows us that there's a trend in the right direction of uh, many of these breeding companies developing seeds for indoor growers that are going to be uh, more effective, uh, more effectively grown under uh, indoor farm conditions that are going to have a higher chance of burn risk. So knowing that this exponential uh, growth phase is really a risk of calcium demand, we wanted to decrease the calcium demand by reducing the daily light integral of the amount of light received over the crop uh, during the period of highest burn risk, which is in this, uh, this end stage period of 20 to 20 days of transplant. So we selected two of the cultivars that we found to be CLE, the most sensitive cultivar to tip burn, and then Rex, which is a moderately sensitive cultivar. Uh, and we grew them under the same tip burn inducing condition. But in this case, we 
know that tip burn risk is usually going to happen 20 plus days after transplant. So we decided to apply lightning treatments to preempt the onset of tip burn at 16 days after transplant. Uh, and at 16 days, we either kept the same uh, daily light intensity consistent through the whole crop with 100% lighting, uh, is about 17.4 moles per day, um, or we reduced it to 85, 70, or 55% of that total light intensity. And again, we applied this 16 days after transplant, uh, knowing that we'd run into tip burn risk about 20 days in. And what we found was if we reduced the light intensity, not surprisingly, we're also going to reduce the biomass of these crops. So uh, for flea, we had about a 20, uh, Two percent drop in biomass from the 100% lighting treatment up here to the 55% lighting treatment over there. This had fresh mass on the y-axis and our DLI reduction on the x-axis. And for Rex, we had about a 26% decrease in biomass as we reduced that light intensity over these various uh, different crops um, or the, over these various treatments. Um, and we saw, interestingly, a uh, cultivar-specific and also a nonlinear relationship to to burn. For at least one of the cultivars. So for Clee, until we get down to 55% uh, of that initial DLI, we have the same amount of tipper severity across uh, those 70, 85, and 100% lighting treatments. For Rex, we had a more linear reduction with the lowest light intensity, 55%, uh, having no tipper at all over the entire crop. So what we wanted to look at here was whether or not this is going to be something that's going to contribute profitably to uh, those growers. So while growth is reduced 22 or 26%, we're reducing that tip burn severity at the lowest light treatment by up to 75 or 100%. And in this case, for only CLE in the lowest light treatment, we're seeing an increase in the contribution to the profit margin for these crops. So we can see an increase of $2.55 per meter square of marketable biomass because the a reduction in tip burn severity is uh, outweighing the reduction in biomass for that crop. And so for all of the other treatments, uh, like I should have mentioned the white bars are marketable value in uh, dollars per meter squared and the electrical savings, as we reduce that power consumption, we do save uh, up to $1.35 uh, per meter squared in electrical cost over that last 12 days. Um, uh, and for Rex, that biomass loss is just too great. But for CLE, with that lowest treatment, we're seeing a, a, a positive contribution to the profit margin. Um, and so this means we can use this as a viable uh, strategy for this highly sensitive cultivar, uh, which has a lot of tip burn that it can lose um, versus the amount of biomass that's going to be lost by the same lighting reduction. Um, and so after we, we looked at this first mitigation, we also wanted to look at a rather unique mechanism that's uh, um, not commonly used in any applied fashion. Um, there are two ways to open the stomates uh, on, uh, on plants generally. The first is a reduction in subcellular uh, CO2 concentration. And the second is uh, this impact of 100% blue light on a uh, stomato that uh, um, uh, is reported to activate this phototropin in the guard cells of many plants. Not all plants, but a, a wide range of uh, plants have been studied for this, for this mechanism. So I won't make you digest and read all about this mechanism, but basically uh, blue light, in addition to driving a small amount of photosynthesis it's in, at low intensity, uh, it also excites this phototropin resulting in a cascade producing malate, and then uh, it's able to increase the uh, swelling of the guard cells to facilitate gas exchange at the leaf surface. And so these guard cells begin to open, and then we start to see this uh, increase in the small aperture, uh, facilitating more transpiration, facilitating uh, CO2 exchange. Um, and then also, we it's been reported that red light, in addition to this blue light, will enhance this mechanism and force those stomachs open even at low intensity. And in this case, that's a photosynthesis mediated response, uh, consuming the CO2 below the, uh, below the stomata, and then uh, creating a mechanism that's going to drive stomatal opening. Um, so we wanted to take advantage of these uh, two mechanisms um, and see if we could try and uh, position the plant in a way where we could increase the transpiration without increasing, without increasing the calcium demand. So we selected two spectra, 100% well, blue light, I'll call D100, and 80% blue and 20% red light, which is DADR20 in this case. Um, 
and uh, we wanted to find where the compensation site was for these various for, for the, the two same uh, less cultivars under the two different light qualities. So for clean rex and under D100 lighting, which is at the top, and then the ADR20 at the bottom, uh, the photosynthetic rate is on the y-axis. And I highlighted uh, zero here, which is the light compensation point. Um, above the light compensation point, we're going to be driving calcium demand as the plant is able to positively uh, contribute to growth. Below that point, we're still going to be, uh, uh, we're not going to be increasing the growth, but we are going to be uh, hopefully driving some transpiration. And so we wanted to select the light intensity that was below this light compensation point for these uh, light qualities at, uh, for the two cultivars. So if we see on this, uh, the red circles here, this is where 30 micromoles is on the x-axis. And we're well below the light compensation point uh, for both of the different crops, uh, for both of the different cultivars uh, and both the different light qualities. And so what we wanted to do was apply this, um, this treatment during the nighttime. So we have the same tipper inducing daytime condition, but at night we're applying 30 micromoles of D100 for the ADR20 lighting. Um, and we're separating out these lighting treatments and photon fill over between the treatments by covering the walls with this black cloth and curtains and various other things to try and keep them, keep them truly separate. Uh, and what we found with applying this type of lighting, um, in addition to a third treatment that was just nighttime darkness, the same, uh, everything else the same during the daytime, we didn't see a change in yields that indicates to us that even though we are adding a small amount of light during the entire nighttime, it's below that compensation point. We're not driving additional growth in these plants. Um, and it's, uh, uh, we're resulting in the same yield um, and during the daytime, all the plants behaved the same. We had no, we saw no differences in daytime gas exchange when we measured at the leaf surface. Um, but we do see some interesting differences in nighttime gas exchange. So here's the model conductance on the y-axis, and then B100, D80, R20, and control, which is nighttime darkness on the x-axis. And for clean racks, we saw a call for a specific response. So if the control is our baseline, we're seeing an increase in stomatal conductance with either of the lighting treatments. We're seeing it most with D100 lighting, and BADR20 is actually not significantly different from D100 or the control. Um, but this is, even though the trend appears the same in CLE, this is also not significant. But when we look at transpiration rate, uh, we do see uh, an increase in the transpiration of the with D100 lighting for both of the cultivars uh, over far in excess of the control. This is about an increase of 40 to 60% in transpiration. Um, and so we can also include from this that the uh, You may have run out of battery. You can just hit the push. Yeah, there's the button. Oh, there's that. Yeah, there's the button. Okay. Is that okay? All right. That's better. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. So uh, even though we're driving more transpiration for, uh, under these two light qualities, we're actually not seeing any difference in tipper and severity. Um, and so we thought this was related probably to the fact, even though we're opening stomates, we still have, we still have a very low uh, airspeed in this chamber. And so um, the flux gradient relationship uh, from the leaf surface to the aerial uh, region is probably not enough to drive that transpiration to prevent tipper. So we repeated this experiment where we did B100 at nighttime darkness with uh, fanning, uh, downward vertical fanning, which has uh, been reported to be very effective at reducing tipper. Uh, and in this case, we see some interesting stuff, um, basically still cultivar specific responses. Uh, but in this case, uh, Rex is the one that doesn't want to have any responses and Klee is the one that wants to have all the responses. So under fanning, which is uh, the underscore F uh, treatments here, um, we see a, a great decrease in stomatal conductance because under that uh, fanning treatment, they uh, are obviously experiencing more transpiration and they're limiting the stomatal conductance. But this also resulted in both cultivars with a complete elimination of tip burn for uh, uh, CLE and Rex. So we knew this was effective before, but uh, we thought maybe this contribution of nighttime lighting might drive additional photosynthesis, or if there's some tip burn left over, we'd see that completely removed. Um, but uh, uh, basically, fanning is a much stronger input uh, than uh, nighttime lighting it, driving this uh, mass flow. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this, but basically 
we're able to develop a tip burn inducing condition. Um, that's great because we need to have a better evaluation system for uh, tip burn risk. Um, we can reduce the DLI over the lettuce crop, and that actually could be a more profitable strategy at reducing because we can reduce tip burn um, and nighttime dim lighting. Although it's interesting and kind of fun, uh, it does not increase in that transpiration to relieve that tip burn risk. But airflow is very, very highly effective, and so we should definitely continue developing new ways to input more airflow into these types of systems. So, thank you, guys. How big of an issue is this in the indoor farms? Is it 10% or 50%? Or uh, most indoor farms are probably running into this at, at some point. Uh, unless they can find like really resistant cultivars, which are pretty rare, then you're, you, it's very likely that you're going to run into this, this type of issue. Yeah. yeah. So what, what is the source of the resistance? cultivar? We, we are trying to figure that out still. There's a lot of, there's a lot of recent interest in that. Um, there are some leaf morphology characteristics, but there's also some cell proliferation and calcium transporter genes that have been known to be involved in this, but it's not totally clear yet. And so it's been a, a big interest in the last maybe three years to, to look at this. But um, uh, for the open field applications, it hasn't been much of a problem uh, because of the difference in condition. And so now it's starting to become like, we really need to figure this out for indoor growers to be able to properly grow lettuce without this issue. So if you have a head with tip burn, what happens when you take it to market? Do they just toss the whole thing out? Or yeah. They, okay. Oh yeah, they, they reject it. If there's, if there's over 5% tip burn, often they reject the whole crop. So that means you either have to go in and remove physically the tip burn portion or sell it as a cut leaf product where you take out the tip burn part. But once the tip burn happens, even though it's not, you know, it's, it's a deficiency, uh, that also becomes an, a, a pathway for opportunistic pathogen infection. And so that becomes a concern as well, in addition to consumers thinking like, this looks like a damaged product I don't wanna eat or buy. So I think you just showed the fan treatment for two cultivars. Did you do that with all the other ones? Was it I, effective? I did not do it on all the other ones, but it worked amazingly well with our highest tip burn severity cultivar. So like the most sensitive one that we were able to find, uh, which makes me think that it was, it's likely going to be effective for uh, most of the other ones that we tested. Um, and generally, that's been that's been the case in other studies that have looked at that. And so uh, that is something I'd like to test. But uh, does the energy of running the fans though still make it marketable, or have you like the economics? Of yeah, the the, co the cost of running the fans is rather cheap compared to the cost of uh, you know lost revenue. Um, and so it's 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 a no brainer decision generally. The problem with implementing that in indoor farms is mostly because of the limited aerial headspace and you're competing with lights and other things mm -hmm. for space. Uh, and that downward direction is important because it has to get near the meristem to break up that boundary layer. Um, and so it's a big engineering problem to try and design better systems to manage that airflow solution uh, because a lot of these farms have like a very custom built type of structure. And so that's that's where the limitation is in implementing that technology. Yeah. So it looks to me that uh, this is caused by uh, under abundant water conditions, uh, outside leaves transpire the most water and the insides do not. Mm -hmm. uh, has literature um, shown anything about in order to uniform uh, transpir uh, to make the the transpiration more uniform across the plant would uh, temporarily induce water stress. Would that homogenize transpiration across the plant? So if, if for a short time, uh, the water, the plant comes under water stress and then you you pump water in and then the water, the plant, so the, there's a larger source capacity, uh, sorry, sink capacity at that time, would then the inner leaves transpire more? That's a great question. I actually haven't thought about that. 
Potentially, yeah. I suppose that could that could be possible, but um, I'll have to think about that for sure. Yeah, but that's an interesting theory. Just a quick one. Um, has anybody done like a total life cycle analysis of this to compare with the total environmental impact and a no. growing traditional crop? Uh, so, no, nobody, nobody's done that much uh, uh, TLA with this yet, but I'm, I'm like, I'm hoping to see that that's something that we invest some significant time into doing. Um, there's, there's some obvious, obvious pros and cons with indoor production systems like this, yeah. like energy use and things like that are, are a challenge. So um, uh, I'm not, sure, I know greenhouse versus open field has been done a lot, but I'm not sure if indoor farm to uh, both of those systems has been conducted yet. Thanks for your talk. I was curious, is there a threshold level of calcium that must be present? Uh, no, it's actually, I found it's cultivar specific. So yeah, varies completely each one. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's not very helpful, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah.